Welcome back. Well, let's take you to one of the top stories today. The Bank of England warning about the UK facing its longest recession. Our London correspondent, Tenyo Lao Yitayo, brings us the latest from London. Uh, well, good evening. Since the Bank of England's last meeting, UK financial markets have been through a period of turbulence and the outlook for the economy has worsened. The Bank of England's warning is clear. The country will see its longest recession since records began. Well, the pound slumped 2% lower against the US dollar uh, in reaction to the announcement today. For Britons, especially homeowners, it's concerning as the hike will have a knock-on effect on mortgages and, and rents. The Bank of England forecasts that if interest rates um, continue to rise, those whose mortgage deals are coming to an end could see their annual payments soar by up to £3,000. Well, amid the energy crisis and the rising cost of living, trade unions are also warning that workers will suffer uh, fresh financial hardship. The UK's Chancellor, Jeremy Hunt, in his response admitted that there are no easy options and that the bank has taken the needed action uh, to return inflation to target. He added that the government's number one priority is to grip inflation, to restore stability and to sort out public finances. The central bank doesn't think inflation will start to fall back until next year. Uh, and let's just briefly listen to the BOE governor, Andrew Bailey, who explained at the news conference today that more interest rate hikes will be required in the coming months uh, for this to happen. Low and stable inflation is the bedrock of a stable economy a predictable economy in which people can go about their lives and plan for their futures with confidence. An economy in which hard-earned money keeps its value. If we do not act forcefully now, it will be worse later on. And as the forecast we are publishing today shows, it is a tough road ahead. The sharp increase in energy prices caused by Russia's invasion of Ukraine has made us poorer as a nation. But from where we stand now, we think inflation will begin to fall back from the middle of next year, probably quite sharply. Now, to make sure that happens, bank rate may have to go up further over the coming months. We can't make promises about future interest rates. But based on where we stand today, we think bank rate will have to go up by less than currently priced in financial markets. Well, for now, Millicent, central bank policymakers are waiting for the government's budget announcement on November 17th for more details on spending plans and tax policies, which could influence uh, what happens to inflation next year. London correspondent Tenio La Uyitayo there with that latest. Meanwhile, Britain's interior minister, Sarada Breverman, today visited a migrant processing centre, the southern English port of Dover. The Dover facility is a first stop for thousands of people making the dangerous journey across the English Channel before being sent to other accommodation while their claims to stay in Britain are reviewed. On Sunday, a man threw petrol bombs attached to the fireworks at the centre and then killed himself. Ms. Breverman is facing heavy criticism after she told Parliament on Monday that she was working to stop the invasion on the southern coast. Lawmakers across the political spectrum warn of the risk of using inflammatory language. And Turkish President Tayyip Erdogan said late yesterday that he may carry out diplomacy with Twitter's new boss, Elon Musk, to avoid paying the monthly $8 charge for the verified badge. Well, after buying Twitter for $44 billion last week, Musk said the company will charge $8 a month for its blue service, which includes a sought-after blue check mark. A blue check mark next to a person's username on the social media platform means, means Twitter has confirmed that the account belongs to the person or company uh, claiming it. Twitter is currently free for most users. More than 80% of Twitter users who took part in a recent poll said they would not pay for the check mark. Some 10% uh, said they were willing to pay $5 a month. Joining me now to talk more about this is uh, Victor Kuala, technology analyst. Uh, he joins me uh, right now. Thanks for joining me on the program. Thank you very much for having me. 
All right, so what do you make of this new regime uh, of Twitter under Elon Musk? I find it very interesting that you call it a regime. Uh, I think it's interesting. I mean, to me, it's a new, I think it's a new dispensation, right? Um, a businessman takes over an already existing business and is trying to make their own new set of rules. But you can also think about it as a regime because of how Elon Musk typically administers um, his own things. Um, I read an analysis earlier today that the crux of it was saying that Elon Musk is bad at selling to consumers. So he's used to building cars, he's used to selling to businesses and corporations. But when it comes to building these products that the consumer will use, he's terrible at communicating the value proposition. But I think it's an interesting thing, and I think it's something that is normal in the business world, basically. So he said also on Tuesday that subscribers with the blue check marks would get priority in replies, mentions, search, would be able to post longer videos and audios. Um, I mean, these are sort of like juicy details. Do you think majority of people yeah. would be interested in this? I think it's one thing to be interested. I think it's another thing to be able to afford it. Um, $8 is steep for the average Twitter user. And just to provide some, some sort of context, this feature he's talking about, this feature he's talking about, Twitter Blue, has been available since June last year, I think. It was launched in June last year. And it was priced at $4.99. And it had even it had way less um, offerings at the time. But now Elon Musk wants to upgrade the offerings, um, almost double the price. And to answer your question, a lot of people will be interested in it, but I think a large population of Twitter users will not be able to afford it. So one wonders, what was his goal? Or was that his goal all the while, trying to make back his money, $44 billion, and of course, interest? I mean, I feel like if, if anybody is spending that amount of money on Twitter, you know, um, they definitely have a plan to get the money back or become profitable or at least make revenue in the short term. Twitter was listed on stock exchange some nine years ago. And since then, the company has posted profits just twice. Uh, I think it was 2018 and 2019. And out of all the social media platforms that exist, Twitter has still, Twitter is yet to properly monetize, you know, a lot of the channels that other media, social media platforms use. So and to a very large extent, I believe Musk is being aggressive because of the nature of the platform itself. And yes, he definitely will want to make his money back. All that talk of, um, you know, of doing a good thing for the world is just interesting talk. It's just talk. You know, he's a businessman at the end of the day. So do you see any rivals springing up? And with regards to free speech, has there been any surprises? Um, I, rivals, rivals. So this would be a great time for a Twitter alternative to you know, be created and maybe ex-Twitter employees build something that will rival Twitter. But it's easier said than done. You know, Twitter has kind of gotten into the fabric of society. Twitter has become very essential to a lot of things. You know, activism, way of life, business and everything. It's just, it's going to be difficult to upstage that in, in this short time, right? So major competitor, no. Maybe if Twitter's popularity wins over the years, you know, a platform will step in. But in the near future, I don't see any competitor. But free speech, um, I in, in the long run, and I'm interested to see how this plays out too, because in the long run, I, I want to see how, you know, Musk thinks generally about content moderation, because this is what is, this is what engenders free speech to a very large extent. This is what makes people able to um, express themselves on platforms, not just Twitter. So I, I don't, I, I've still not seen concrete thoughts around this content moderation thing, you know, around making the platform safe. Um, this will this will show what free speech looks like in the near future. For now, I don't know that anything is happening out of the ordinary for free speech. It's just a lot of you know people reacting, you know, just a lot of react reactions to the change because this is that's what's happening. People are reacting to this change in the way things have always been. All right, Victor, thanks for your perspective on this issue. We continue to watch, you know, how things play out on Twitter. Thanks again, Victor Equala, technology media much. analyst. Thanks. Yeah.
Well, let's go to other stories now. Pakistan former Prime Minister Imran Khan has been shot and wounded in the leg in an attack on his protest march in the eastern city of Waziribad. It is unclear whether the politician was deliberately targeted as one of the senior aides claimed or he was hit by indiscriminate gunfire. Members of his PTI party said another four people were hurt in the shooting. Mr Khan, 70, was leading the march on the capital told Islamabad to demand snap elections after he was ousted in April. Another party leader, provincial health minister, said Mr Khan is in stable condition. An unnamed male suspect was later arrested, according to Pakistan's Geo TV. North Korea has fired an intercontinental ballistic missile, ICBM, but failed mid-flight, says the South Korean military. The ICBM launch, the North 7th this year, sparked an alert in Japan, but fell short to landing in the sea. Tensions are escalating amid fears the North will soon conduct a nuclear test. Yesterday, both Koreas fired missiles near each other's waters. The exchange saw the most number of missiles launched by the North in a single day. North Korea's multiple launches comes as the U.S. and South Korea are staging their largest ever joint air drills, which Pyongyang has strongly criticized as aggressive and provocative. Meanwhile, China today avoided commencing directly on the North Korean missile launches or potential sanctions, but said they hoped all parties could peacefully resolve issues through dialogue. And according to an analyst, North Korea's consecutive test launches of missiles, which include the ICBM, is to show their military capability. Young Mo Jin, a professor at the University of North Korean Studies in Seoul, says the purpose of the test is to press the United States by claiming the failure of the Biden administration's North Korea policy on the occasion of midterm elections and to urge them to withdraw their hostile policy towards North Korea. The ICBM and nuclear tests are a set. If North Korea considers this ICBM test as a success, then they will decide the timing and whether to conduct a nuclear test based on U.S. midterm elections and Biden administration's response. The test could be successful if the purpose of it is a state separation, but we cannot exclude the possibility of failure if the test is for atmospheric reentry or other things. Unlike in the past, North Korea has become bold in showing off their capabilities as a nuclear state. The purpose of the ICBM is to press the United States by claiming the failure of Biden's administration North Korea's policy on the occasion of midterm elections and to urge them to withdraw their hostile policy. Well, let's take you to the United States with just a few days to go until voters turn out to the polls for the midterm elections. Former U.S. President Barack Obama campaigned in Phoenix yesterday for Arizona's Democratic candidates on the ballot. The former Democratic president spoke against Republican election deniers, the right to vote, and also raised concerns about the state of democracy. We all should agree that women everywhere should be the ones making decisions about their own body. It shouldn't be controversial to say that the most intimate, personal health care choices should be made by a woman in consultation with her doctor and not a bunch of mostly male politicians. Most GOP politicians, they're not even pretending that the rules apply to them. They, they seem to be willing to just make stuff up. I mean, I don't, I'm old enough to remember when Arizona elected not just John McCain, but other Republicans who, they might have, they fought hard in elections, they, they didn't agree with Democrats on stuff, but they were decent, honorable public servants. That feels like a long time ago. 
And to other stories now, news that many have been waiting for, news of peace talks between warring sides of Ethiopia's Tigray conflict that held in South Africa over the past week and led to an agreement to end hostilities between the parties, paving the way for security and stability in the Tigray region. The peace talks included a high-level panel for the African Union-led Ethiopian peace process, which included former president of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, Olusegun Obasanjo, former president of the Republic of Kenya, Uhuru Kenyatta, former deputy president of the Republic of South Africa, and also representatives of the United Nations. The two parties Well, joining us to talk more about this historic decision is uh, Bekele Woyecha. He is a member of Defending Ethiopia UK, also a human rights activist. Thank you for joining me on the program. Thank you so much for having me. Is it truly a new dawn for Ethiopia following the halting of hostilities? It is, yes. This is the time, you know, for us to give peace a chance because by the, end of, by the end of the day, it is the win for Ethiopia and Ethiopians. It's always good to have that uh, peace talks, you know, and come up, come to a conclusion. You know, we want the gun to be silenced. So it's going to be the beginning of an obvious journey. It should be for all of us to actually support and move forward. Yes, but, you know, a lot of people wonder, is it as much as, you know, dotting the lines, um, how much more do the parties need to do to maintain this peace? It's really important, and it must be in the interest of all. You know, it is in the interest of Ethiopians across Ethiopia and around the world for this peace uh, talks and peace agreement to be implemented you know, in, according, uh, in accordance with uh, the signed agreement and in accordance to the constitution of Ethiopia. And we are really grateful for to our African brothers and sisters who were able to bring uh, this um, to a conclusion, you know, where we asked it for African solutions for African problems. And we are so grateful, to, you know, to Alyssa Gennabas and Joe and the the senior leadership, you know, the elders who really took this uh, forward. So it's now down to us, to every one of us. It's not only about the political parties, you know, or the government, but every one of us. But this is, you know, something we have been waiting for, and we have we, we have a duty to see it implemented. When you look back as to when this started and how much, um, you know, damage the, the conflict has caused where would you say, um, you know, that uh, the country can start to rebuild? You know, first of all, this uh, conflict shouldn't have happened, you know. So it is so disappointing and, you know, really so heartbreaking that it happened. But there must be an end. There must be a conclusion. And we must move forward as Ethiopians. You know, the, the conflict really was a challenge for Ethiopians around the world, but those especially in northern Ethiopia suffered a lot. This shouldn't have happened. Two years from today, exactly two years from today, the northern command of the Ethiopian armed forces was attacked. And that was the reason why this war actually took place, uh, took place for the past two years. But you know, this shouldn't have happened, and we should have found a solution. And Ethiopians were ready. The Ethiopian government was ready to find a solution, a lasting solution for this crisis. But there were many other players. That was a challenge. There were many other players who really were fueling the conflict. But we say we have to find a solution for our own problems. And we have now reached out a, so a solution mediated by our African brothers and sisters. And once again, I say it, we are so grateful. You know, you know, some might think we are in a jungle, but we should remember there are lions and lionesses in a jungle, and they have done what is honorable. So the peace agreement that has been signed between the Ethiopian government and, and the Tigray People's Liberation Front is commendable. It's now down to us to move forward. Think about rebuilding the northern Ethiopia. You know, think about development, prosperity in Ethiopia. 
and see and address all challenges we may have in a peaceful, democratic way from now on. And not to mention the humanitarian situation as well, building back together. Uh, we hope that this peace uh, subsists. We'd like to thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Bekele Woyeche, as a human rights activist, also a member, Defend Ethiopia UK. Thank you for joining me on the program. Thanks for having me. Welcome back. And while the AU has brokered peace in Ethiopia and Tigray, the humanitarian situation continues. The World Health Organization Director General, Dr. Tedros Gabrieso, says the situation remains catastrophic, adding that the siege of six million people by Ethiopian and Eritrean forces is the worst crisis in the world. He adds that since the beginning of the siege, food, medicine and other basic services have been weaponized. Meanwhile, the WHO continues to call for unfettered humanitarian access for millions of people in dire need. This week marks two years since the siege of Tigray began. The Afar and Amhara regions are also affected by the conflict, but WHO and our partners have access to those regions and have been able to deliver humanitarian aid. However, the humanitarian situation in Tigray remains catastrophic. As I have said before, the siege of six million people by Ethiopian and Eritrean forces is the worst humanitarian crisis in the world. Since the beginning of the siege, food, medicine, and other basic services have been weaponized. It has now been more than two months since the last humanitarian aid reached Tigray. But even before that, the aid reaching Tigray was a trickle nowhere near enough to meet the needs. WHO continues to call for unfettered humanitarian access for the millions of people who are in dire need. And we continue to call on the international community to give the crisis in Tigray the right attention. The only solution to the situation remains peace. And we hope that the talks now taking place in South Africa will lead to a peaceful and enduring resolution. Staying in Africa, Burkina Faso's new military leader has visited Mali for his first foreign trip since taking part, holding what his Malian counterparts held as fruitful exchanges on peace and security. Captain Ibrahim Traore, who seized power in Burkina Faso September 30 coup, flew to the Malian capital, Bamako, for what Mali's foreign ministry said would be a roughly three-hour friendship and working visit. The two men headed to a VIP airport lounge for private talks before continuing on to the presidency for further meetings with their respective delegations. One of the issues discussed was the fight against terrorism, referring to the two countries' bloody struggle against jihadists. Traore asked Lieutenant Colonel Paul Henry Santiago uh, da Mimba, who in January had toppled Burkina's last elected president, Rock Mark Christian Kabore. South African police have discovered bodies of 19 suspected illegal miners in the town of uh, Krugersdorp, west of Johannesburg. The police said in a statement that they responded to a call following the discovery of the bodies in one of the active mines in the area. They said initial investigations suggested the deceased were moved and placed where they were discovered. It is unclear how the alleged illegal miners died, although the police said uh, they did not suspect any foul play. The police adds that post-mortem examinations would be done to determine the cause of death. Away from Africa, ECB governing council member and Latvian central bank governor Martins Kazaks has advocated for higher rates and said there is no need to pause increases around the turn of the year, even if a recession for the currency bloc is now the baseline. Uh, Kazakhs told a news conference in Riga alongside EBC President Christine Lagarde that there is no need to pause at the turn of the year. According to Ms Lagarde, the European Central Bank must be attentive to policy decisions by the US Federal Reserve as it influences global markets, but it cannot just mirror moves in Washington. 
we have to be mindful of each other and, uh, and we have to be attentive to potential spillovers, spillbacks, mm -hmm. as I think the Fed is also mindful of. But each of us, the Fed, just like the ECB, have our respective mandate and while we have to factor in uh, such uh, element like the Fed monetary policy decisions and other elements of international nature uh, that will help us determine the best monetary policy, we are not alike mm -hmm. and we cannot progress either at the same pace, mm -hmm. uh, under the same diagnosis of our economy. We are also uh, influenced by uh, the consequences, particularly through the, uh, the, the financial markets, to a lesser extent uh, through trade as well, mm -hmm. because clearly the uh, exchange rate yeah. Uh, yeah. matters and has to be taken into account in our inflation yeah. projections. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And for the U.S. Federal Reserve Chairman, Jerome Powell, the ultimate level of the Federal Reserve's benchmark policy rates is likely higher than previously estimated. In remarks at a press conference after the Fed raised rates by 75 basis points for a fourth consecutive meeting, Mr. Powell said there is significant uncertainty around the level of rates needed to bring down inflation. He believes there remains a chance that the U.S. economy can escape a recession as the Federal Reserve raises interest rates to lower inflation, the uh, chairman acknowledged the central bank's latest ethics stumbles and said the Fed was working hard to make sure it meets its very uh, new stringent standards. And it's not a sight that you'd see every day, but today British Prime Minister Rishi Sunak surprised commuters in London Underground Station as he helped a military uh, veterans charity sell poppies ahead of Remembrance Sunday. Mr Sunak posed for photos with commuters as he sold the poppies at Westminster Underground Station near Downing Street. In Britain, the United States, Canada, Australia and New Zealand, the Remembrance Poppy became a symbol of respect for the war dead, a source of support for veterans and their families, and a way to reflect on the horrors of war. The poppies are usually sold at stations, churches, offices, schools and factories across Britain. By the Royal British Legion charity with religious services on Remembrance Sunday, which takes place on the 13th of November. and that's our program this evening. Thank you for watching. I'm Melissa Walker.